Okay, um, everyone, welcome back to our uh, webinar. Um, I wanna thank everybody who attended this morning's session and provided some really excellent and, uh, questions and feedback for our consideration. I think it's making um, the workshop much more productive. So thank you for participating. This afternoon, we're going to have a session on lessons learned, and we're gonna hear the perspectives of a lot of um, experts in the field. So um, Margaret Landy is gonna be facilitating this session. I'll turn it over to her. Hi, everyone. So yes, we're going to kick off this afternoon. We have six learned speakers. Um, our first one is John Hetfield, who's um, representing uh, attending veterinarians and the complexities that they oversee when they think about contingency planning. Um, you have their, his bio and your materials, so I'll just turn it over to John. Thank you, Dr. Landy. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate you being here this afternoon. Well, this afternoon on the East Coast, anyway. Um, as uh, as we, we begin, begin this segment, segment better, how's that? As we begin this segment, uh, as Dr. Landy mentioned, I'll be, be providing a perspective from the attending veterinarian point of view. I am careful to claim expertise in any particular area, but I have a lot of experience, um, which brings to mind one of my favorite quotes by Will Rogers, which has to do with experience and judgment, something like, good judgment is based on experience, and most of that is based on bad judgment. Um, in my case, that happens to be true. And so I'm going to share with you some uh, real life experiences that I've experienced over the course of my career as a veterinarian who's been a, a you know part of the team responding to crises and disasters. And so I'll share that with you. I've got a pretty simple uh, agenda for this next segment. Um, as mentioned, we'll cover lessons learned. And I'll highlight the difference between, I think, preparation and reality. I've come up with what I'm calling principles of disaster management, and I'll sprinkle in some take home points that would have helped me had I heard these earlier in my career as I thought about uh, preparing for uh, contingency plans or disaster plans. I'll use crisis management, disaster plans, contingency planning. For me, they're kind of all equivalent in, in terms of nomenclature. Another quote uh, by the famous boxer, um, and, and I, I will come back to this sentiment uh, time and again. Everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. And um, unfortunately, as things evolve in a crisis, sometimes that's what it feels like. And Mike Tyson wasn't the first to think of this. We go back to World War II area with Winston Churchill. Plans are of little importance, but planning is essential. And Dwight Eisenhower had much the same sentiment, but a little stronger wording. Plans are worthless, but planning is essential. Uh, so not to cast doubt on the plans that we develop should a crisis occur in our institutions. Um, this is a subtle point that I think is pretty meaningful. And we'll come back to that in the next few minutes. So the difference between plans versus planning is a uh, core to the, the next uh, part of my talk. Just for some perspective, i am uh, spent virtually most of my career in, in academic veterinary medicine, research animal medicine, uh, with some time at ALAC that will come into play. And I've had direct personal experience with many of the things you see, or all of the things you see on the slide here, certainly with my time in North Carolina with uh, hurricanes, floods, uh, in the Midwest with tornadoes, we've had facility fires, extremist issues, um, and a cyber attack, which was not something that was on my radar seven or eight years ago. It's squarely on my radar now. And in terms of impact, this was huge. Um, bottom center there is a depiction of a, a HVAC. It's been mentioned a few times already, the importance of these mechanical systems that support our animal facilities and I'll talk more about, about that. And of course, as all of you have, the, the uh, cor uh, coronavirus pandemic. So that's sort of the breadth and scope of my, my experience dealing with these different crises. 
as we forge ahead, I'm going to lump these into what I've kind of got these two big categories. I, ones I call external and regional versus internal. And I think this is fairly intuitive for most folks. Um, it's interesting that in my time at ALAC International, I collected data of reports to ALAC involving uh, institutions uh, informing ALAC of disasters that occurred that had a significant impact on animal welfare. Uh, so I looked at these over about a five-year period. Now this data is old, so a grain of salt, but I suspect the broad brushstrokes are much the same today as they were when I collected this data uh, several years ago. But over 70% of all disasters reported to ALAC over a five-year period involved internal or mechanical system failure. So if we're talking likelihood of impact, we have to look inwardly, I think, and be careful to consider those as part of our vulnerabilities in an animal care program. If the HVAC system goes south, particularly temperatures rise, or the reheat coils fail in the open position, animals can become overheated very quickly, depending on species that can be life-threatening very quickly. And so over 70%, according to that data set, indicated this was a, a very common occurrence. So if take home point on this one, if mechanical systems are not currently on your list of things to think about in disaster management, it should be because the probably the most likely scenario. So the seven principles of disaster preparedness, I tried to come up with 10. Uh, I can only come up with seven. 10 is a better number than seven, but. Uh, you'll be glad by the time I get to seven that there there are not ten, um, but there there is no hypothetical involved in any of these. I've experienced all of these firsthand, and since this is a lesson learned portion, that's what we're going to talk about. I could I could spend my whole time telling stories about what happened when and what we did and what worked and what didn't work. I'll spare you that, except for a couple of examples to illustrate a few points. Uh, principle number one. Uh, you are likely not in control, maybe uh, even of your own animal program uh, when it comes to disaster management. It obviously depends on the type of disaster. And I'll hearken back to two experiences I had years and years ago. One was Hurricane Floyd. Um, this was in, uh, when I was in North Carolina. This hurricane parked itself off the coast. The winds weren't terrible, but the rain was epic. And this thing stalled off the coast of North Carolina for several days and dumped an incredible amount of water out of the sky. So the flooding um, in the Atlantic coastal plain of eastern North Carolina is very flat. So when the waters rise, water goes everywhere. Um, the day after the rain subsided, um, I, I decided it was my job to go to the animal facility to see what kind of shape things were in. And it was a, uh, it looked like a war zone out there. Trees were down, power lines were down, water in low points in the road. I mean, deep water, 10, 15 feet of flood water. And I'm trying to work my way to campus to, to check these animal facilities out. And I drove up on an uh, intersection that was underwater and there's a police car in the middle of the road. Uh, it's early in the morning, it's just getting light. And he was not too excited to see me drive up. Um, road was flooded, so I did a U-turn and was started to head back the original direction. And he he followed me, hit hit me with the with the flashing lights, pulled me over. And uh, to say he was unhappy is an understatement. Like, what kind of knucklehead is out driving around on these roads the day after a major hurricane? So I pulled out of my glove compartment my ID card that the university had given me as a first responder to be out on the roads to go to the medical center that would um, get me out of jail. He was thoroughly unimpressed with my ID card, literally took it, looked at it, said, I don't know what this is, and threw it into the floodwaters. And um, he, his next statement was, put your hands on the car. So he was he was irritated enough with me to, to to I think cuff me and take me down to the station. So I did a lot of quick talking, and uh, persuaded him that he should let me go and I'll behave myself. Um, I eventually, after many hours of driving back roads, found my way to the university. 
But the plan for me to be a first responder on the part of the university to uh, have access to, to be out on the roads failed miserably because the police department, or at least this particular police officer, didn't know anything about it. Um, and as it turns out, my in, my inability or difficulty getting to work proved to be a problem for over the next couple of weeks for staff getting in to actually do animal care. So the regional aspect of that hurricane and flooding made it so that we didn't really have much control about who came in to do what. We, it was beyond our control, and the police weren't particularly happy that knuckleheads like me are out driving around uh, the day after hurricane. Um, another brush with the law, a flooded animal facility. Again, in North Carolina, it's a bright, sunny summer day. I stayed work at late and I'm driving home and there's a huge emergency response on campus. Um, on my route home through campus, driving by a major animal facility, this building on the right, um, the amount of water flowing out of the door of this facility was staggering. I estimate thousands of gallons per minute. Uh, something clearly had gone wrong in the building because outside everything was fine. Um, this building on its first floor housed an extensive animal facility with our notobiotics facility and a lot of uh, animal biosafety level two biocontainment. So I was really alarmed that we had a flooded animal facility and I needed to get in there and, and uh, deal with whatever consequences may be. So I walked up to the courtyard, getting ready to go into another entr entrance into the animal facility and the fire department's there and the police, you know, they're flashing lights everywhere. And a fireman stops me and says, you can't go in. And I said, uh, I'm a attending vet. We have an animal facility in there. It's comprised the whole first floor. And I got to get in there and check out my animals. You're not going in. I have to go in. You're not going in. And we were at loggerheads within minutes. And I was being pretty stubborn and, and he was too. And he waved over a police officer that in no uncertain terms persuaded me very quickly that I needed to stop being a knucklehead and go sit on the curb until I got the green light. So that's what I did. So here's another crisis, a flooded animal facility, and I couldn't even get in the door. Municipal authorities had full control. I had none. So plan for that uh, when you're doing your contingency planning. The, the you, you think you may have authority to make certain decisions and calls, but it's likely that you don't. In Hurricane Floyd, it was very interesting. Um, there's a lot of stories with that because it was we had loss of power for two or three weeks and the floodwaters were terrible. Um, but the emergency operations were at the loading dock of our animal facility. That's another story. So there's the fire department, the police department on the loading dock of a brand new animal facility and they're arguing between themselves who has control over rescue efforts, the police or the fire department. It was remarkable for me to be standing there listening to this, this uh, argument that the municipal authorities hadn't even figured out who was in control at that time. So this can be a really simple question, but it can be very difficult to answer. In that case, the fire department won and they started calling the shots and, and um, off they went. But... I didn't feel so bad that I didn't have control when ultimately even the municipal authorities hadn't thought this through before that hurricane. So you may not be calling the shots and you need to be prepared for that. So the take home point, establish in the institution who has decision-making authority and who speaks for the organization and that institutional level chain of command, not just at the animal team, but at the institutional level. Could I have prevailed upon the vice chancellor or the chancellor or the institutional official to argue on my behalf that I needed access to the animal facility probably would have been a more effective route than this knuckleheaded veterinarian standing out on the street saying he needed to get to campus. Um, so establishing that ahead of time and knowing who has the authority to uh, communicate with municipal authorities is very helpful. Involve the municipal authorities in your planning process. The sooner, the better. And it's not a one and done process. You have to do this in an ongoing fashion. More on that later. Principle number two, uh, predicting human response is folly. This is particularly with regional 
uh, crises that develop, hurricanes or tornadoes or what have you, you need a crisis management team to manage the animal response. And these are typically the people who are involved every day, right? These are our facility managers, veterinary team, uh, members of the IACUC or the IACUC office, um, maybe even some of the researchers. You need a team in order to coordinate an effective response. The problem is you can't predict who's going to show up when they need to show up. They may be unable to respond because of a problem at home. They may just decide that they don't want to respond. They're afraid or they're nervous or they fear for some risk. Others will respond with such passion and zeal that they'll likely place themselves at risk. You can't predict what people may do. In fact, I recall after Hurricane Sandy years ago that ravaged the East Coast in New York City in particular, Dr. Pulliam, a veterinarian at the time, one of the major universities up there showed a picture of a animal care uh, technician standing in chest deep water in the animal room, handing up mouse cages through a hole in the ceiling to somebody else to try and rescue these valuable mouse models. Uh, a valiant effort. Should that fellow have been standing in chest deep water in the animal facility, placing perhaps his life and well being at risk? Probably not. So you can't predict who's going to show up and be on your team or whether or not people will even listen to authority. So plan for that unpredictability. And this is, uh, my advancer is quit working. There it goes. We've said this a number of times throughout the morning and I will underscore it here that the operational chain of command is essential. Um, do this by position, not by person. Who's the, and do it so you establish a chain of authority from first to last. And the deeper the bench, so to speak, the more people you have in this chain of command that can assume decision-making authority, the better. Establish that ahead of time. Make sure everybody knows what that is so that there is no argument about who's in charge should the person above them on the hierarchy tree not be present. Could not be more important. Principle number three, uh, during a crisis, the simplest things aren't. Or perhaps said better, uh, the simplest things are not necessarily easy. Uh, would you know how to order feed if your feed was getting low during a crisis? Uh, bedding, CO2 if you're having to think about uh, large-scale euthanasia, pharmaceuticals for veterinary care, general supplies, et cetera. How do you order them? Literally, who do you call? Or how do you manage that account to get needed supplies? Is contact information from vendors readily available? You might not be on campus or in the animal facility when you need to think about these things. You may be at home. Do you have this information at home? Is it available? Vendor list. Um, do you have a, a sort of a, a depth in your vendor list, primary, secondary, tertiary vendors listed with their contact information? And are those accounts already established beforehand? There's nothing worse than trying to establish an account with a vendor during a crisis. Because chances are you don't have the wherewithal to do that. And I include in the, the local physical plant personnel as well. If you need an electrician or an HVAC technician, do you know how to contact that person um, at all hours of the day or night? The take home point being that in your chain of command, you may have people making decisions that don't have this information easily at hand. They're not familiar with the vendors or the physical plant people. If I had to call the electrician today to, to come out to do an emergency issue, um, I may not know the right number to call. I could probably figure it out. But being the director, I'm not calling these people every day. The managers are. Um, so having this contact information readily available in your disaster plan is crucial. You never know when you're going to need it, and you don't want to have to hunt for it. Principle number four. Um, boy, this one's true. Uh, in my experience, during a crisis, a time warp occurs and speed accelerates. Things move quickly, and they move so quickly, you seldom have enough information to make a 
what you feels like a good decision. You have to make decisions with what you have on the fly, real time. Here's a scenario. It's very similar to one I experienced many times. This happens to be with a, a animal extremist event that we had to deal with years ago. But uh, pardon my lame, um, fictitious names here, but literally get a phone call. Hello, Dr. What now? My name is Sydney right now. I'm with a local news station. We're airing a story about your institution's crisis involving animals. And we would like to interview someone as soon as possible so we can include the interview in the segment. We need it in one hour. The news cycle is very fast and they won't wait. And you need to be prepared to engage with the media in order to communicate properly. I'll have more on that later. So you need to establish in your crisis plan ahead of time with contingencies, who has authority to talk to the media. I would recommend having a basic commentary prepared on things like your animal use policies and the ethics of animal use at your institution. Pre-identify the institutional media team so that these people can be gathered together quickly and then prepare specific details of media response within minutes because chances are that's all you have time to prepare. So pre-prepare the basics of your animal use program and be prepared to have a media management team with a spokesperson pre-identified to engage with the media because if you don't engage, they'll forge ahead without you. And that seldom is a good thing for the institution, at least in my experience. So establish a relationship with the local media to the extent possible. You probably have a news and information office at your institution. They probably know who these media folks are and, and should have a, a, a relationship with them. If you don't have that, do that now and don't wait because when you need that relationship, there won't be time to forge it during a crisis. So when it comes to media response and information management, plan, plan, plan that ahead. And that's uh, specific to certain people and their authority within the institution. This one seems a little harsh now that I see it on the screen, but um, this goes back to the, the difference between plans and planning. Uh, forget plan A. As an ALAC site visitor over the years, I've seen countless um, disaster plans that institutions have developed to being five to six inches thick to one or two pages. Um, the thick ones, I'm always a bit skeptical skeptical because it's a recipe approach. If A happens, this is what we'll do. If B happens, we will do this. The problem is things never evolve the way we think they will evolve. And those knee-jerk recipe kind of by rote decisions often prove to be very limited. So series of if then contingencies may be logical and well thought out, but they may not apply. So do planning instead of plans. So have depth, have a plan B, plan C or plan C like, do we activate our crisis plan? I'm not sure if we do. Well, how do we know that? If we lose cell tower coverage, what do we do? Uh, what do we do to deal with that? If we run out of this certain kind of supply, how do we deal with that? Go down the list of all the things that can break and develop plan B, plan C. Those will likely be more useful than your plan A. Principle number six, and again, this is more on plans versus planning. And I would argue you should set decision-making priorities, an algorithm, if you will. What are the priorities that would govern your decision-making on the fly? So these are core principles or values that your management team would have Teach those in your crisis training rather than a recipe. Something like this might be appropriate. This is just my idea of, of what we have done in the past. So number one priority, personal safety and health, animal well-being and welfare. Number two, these are in rank order. Provision of basic daily care, preservation of irreplaceable models, continuation of research and communication. So if you teach these priorities, anyone in the leadership team, because you don't know who's gonna be there, can make decisions based on your institutional values. So train to those priorities. 
So this is a point that's emphasized in the, in the requirements. Train the management team to use the predetermined priorities rather than specified uh, instructions. Uh, those five inch thick disaster plans seldom work too well. We've talked a lot about new employees in that 30 day rule. And I agree with everything that's been said. When you're onboarding new employees, they're drinking from a fire hose and adding details of a widespread disaster management plan is likely not very practical. So teach them just the basics. Give them more training later. Tabletop exercises that came up earlier, I think they're invaluable. Involve other key non-animal related institutional decision makers. There might be a central command at your institution well above the animal program, and you might need to uh, communicate with them regularly. Involve municipal authorities. We brought in a first responders to show them our biocontainment areas, and we learned very quickly, the first responders said, there's a problem in there, we're not going in. It's too scary. We don't know what's in there. I'm not putting my people at risk. That's good to know when you're planning. And establish relationships with local and state officials and potentially even the FBI. I uh, unfortunately had a, was on a first name basis with our regional FBI agent, mostly for domestic terrorism issues. So training must be ongoing and documented. Uh, there was a question earlier about it being um, burdensome. There's a cost benefit. It is costly. It takes a lot of time, a lot of commitment, a lot of effort, but it will pay off. Quickly go through this one. I think it's self-evident, and then we'll be at the end. Uh, communication could be the most important in my book. If you can't communicate your disaster response as a disaster, how do you communicate? When, where, and with whom? You may not have cell phone service, something that we just sort of expect. Do you have a landline backup? Maybe it's Zoom, or maybe you have pagers. There is such great technology nowadays with long range radio walkie talkies. We supplied all our management team with long range um, walkie talkies, some are even nationwide. And then establish maybe a, a trigger point for in person. Take home point, develop your communication plan ahead of time so that everybody knows what plan A, B, C, and D is. When to communicate. Who has authority to activate the crisis management chain, uh, a team, the chain of command, and the call contract tr contact tree. For most programs, you might have to be at the animal facility. Uh, so maybe it makes most sense to establish where to meet and when to meet or uh, uh, to establish the communication points. With whom? You've got to consider all stakeholders, the, the animal team, the institution crisis control center, the municipal authorities, investigators, and the media. Be clear, concise, factual, simple, compassionate, confident, concerned, patient, and professional goes a long way. Be available often and repeatedly. So here's a scenario that I believe addresses these seven points. Crisis team activation trigger occurred. There was a tornado warning in the county. That's a trigger. Somebody knows that's when we need to activate the team. The animal facility manager in this case activated the animal crisis management team. They had the authority to do that because that was established ahead of time. The phone tree was activated. Conference call was held to assess risk and review strategies. They, re they reviewed the priority list of personnel safety, animal welfare, provision of daily care, et cetera. They coordinated with the university crisis team and they planned the next team meeting. That's a disaster response in this case, in the course of a tornado that likely pervert will preserve animal welfare and ensure animal well-being. So those are my seven prior priorities and principles. If you don't like them, I can make up some others, but you're likely not in control. You can't predict the human response. The simplest things are not necessarily easy. Speed accelerates. Forget plan A, you'll likely be using plan B or C. Set priorities to decide decision-making and train to those goals and communicate. And with that, I'll wrap it up. Thanks for your patience. John, thank you very much. 
Um, as a reminder, John was the first speaker in a total of six speakers we're gonna have. So we're gonna wait questions to the end of the six speakers. And John was talking about it from the perspective of an AB um, attending veterinarian. Our next speaker is Greg Reinhardt, who I believe many of you know. Um, though Greg is at Penn, he spent many years in the pharma industry. So he's actually gonna speak about lessons learned from the pharma side, Greg. Right? Yeah, hi, thank you for the invitation. Um, today, I'm gonna kind of, my talk is a bit at a 10,000 foot kind of philosophical thing mixed in with kind of trivial, helpful things. So I try to put an experience in that way. But um, I've spent 25 years in pharma, 15 as the attending vet and the head vet, lab animal vet for a pharmaceutical company. And then I moved over and I became an institutional official for a, a larger pharmaceutical company. I had 28 facilities around the world I was responsible for. I also was heavily involved in due diligence of anything we went to. So like John, I got to read about 150 other institutions, disaster planning <laughs> type of thing. So anyway, so yeah, I'm gonna some generalization. When I talk about big pharma and there's overlaps between the two, I'm thinking about a large capital investment type of place, multiple buildings probably on the campus, um, business continuity is kind of what they would term their contingency plan, say how business going, and maintenance and engineering is often in-house, which is very different. Um, the building in the picture on the left is, is a $1.3 million, a 1.3 million square foot facility, it probably costs a billion dollars today to build, and that's not including the art. Um, so for biotech, now there's giant biotech companies, so I don't need to say that, but I'll talk about a, a vast majority are often little biotech companies. They're in leased space. They don't own their space. They're standalone facilities. They had limited facilities. Their money, you kind of talk about a burn rate. It's like, oh yeah, we got money for about three years and then we run out. Either we get more money or we sell something or, or we invent something or we taken over. But so resources are, are a bit more challenged. And there's often third party in, in contracted um, maintenance services. So um, in big pharma, there's, there's differences in continuity planning and some of the things. One of it is you're on multiple buildings on campus. I moved a research facility onto a, a manufacturing and office campus. And so we were the odd people in the back. And then um, they were preparing for their annual steam shutdown. So they do that every spring and they clean their boilers, do repairs, and there's no steam on the campus. Well, that doesn't work for vivarium. Steam runs our, our cage washers and our, our reheat coils. So I immediately had to put a stop to that. And that's where I, I became uh, probably on a dartboard for a number of engineers who cut down on their annual spring event. So, um, but we worked that out. But there's priorities on the campus and there's a lot of conflicting ones that are important. Say there's a warehouse, a refrigerated warehouse has $75 million or drug that's in short supply. And when you lose that drug, there are patients that will not get their medicine. Then you could have like a giant freezer farm full of unique one in the, one in the universe type of organisms, rare bacteria and things, fungi and things that are very important. We have a rack of transgenic animals that are unique to the universe. So, you know, you really have to, to me, they're all just as important, but you really have to make sure you're working with people to get things done. But we talked about the vivarium having a, a contingency plan and things. But remember, if you're on a big campus, chances are there's a campus-wide contingency or, or contingency plan. So you need to have representation on that. Um, at first, I went in for the booze shutting down their their uh, steam thing, but I had a very uh, an engineer that worked with me in research. He sat in, and he could talk engineering with them. So we we and he was well versed in what vivariums need. So that was really very helpful. The one thing on on those big campuses, you have um, centralized utilities, steam, electric, water, sewer, all that is kind of centralized there, and there's local controls of things. So that's a good time to work with things. So hopefully you can get some redundancy in the utilities, which is really important, dual sources of service, you know, electrical lines coming in from the south and the north from different spots of the electric grid, which can be very helpful. Um, yeah, I mentioned having a, a, an engineer very knowledgeable in the vivarian operations. And you have to look for our, in mitigation, trying to steer away from issues. You look at sort of major capital projects are being done. That's a perfect time to find money. 
So, cause to run some additional power lines or um, uh, make the steam line different, it's, it's thousands, lots of thousands of dollars. And so during capital projects, they can kind of feed them in there. So uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of panic later. Um, there's another thing too, um, the evil thing would be the, the beware of value engineering. Um, and they would look at the cost, return on investment of things. And that's a very good principle, you know, oh, we're gonna buy a new uh, chiller unit and it's gonna save electricity and it'll pay for itself in five years. So, but when you do risk mitigation of a disaster, it's hard to balance that. You don't have a necessary return on investment. Well, how much does it cost if you lose six months worth of research and those sorts of things? So some of it you have to have, include all the cost of research, long time and stuff like that. In the pharma world, um, getting a product to market is important. So if you could avoid delay of six months or cut off six months to a year in terms of research, that's a big deal if you think of a billion dollar product. So, so some of those arguments is, look, we have to protect this research and things like that. Uh, it does ring true. Now in the little biotechs, you know, they're, they're great, wonderful inventing places, but they're often, they, they're in buildings that is lease space. And, you know, six months ago, it was an insurance company. Now it's, it's a biotech place. And so, the infrastructure may not be there as as inspect as expected and stuff like that. One of the the bigger headaches is emergency power. So that should be something when people are leasing space is to look up front. Can we add, is there emergency power or can we add it? And how difficult is that? And who pays for what and things like that. So that's kind of one of the earlier things you would really want to look at. In a biotech company, the interior is often done by a third party maintenance company and things like that. Um, there may be a single person who's in charge of coordinating all those contracts and things like that. It's really imp important to get those people trained what vibrarium needs are and things like that. And I actually appreciate the attention and talking about uh, engineering things and stuff. And sometimes they like your support. It's like, oh, I want to do something with these chillers, you know, get re extra redundancy. And, and you chime in, oh, I think it's important and it's helpful. I mean, there's a little picture on the top right-hand corner of them, I think that could be the entire company. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different hats are worn by the same people. And in biotech companies is um, finances thing. It's not necessarily the long-term cost of something. It's what I have to write a check for today. Because if it's a, if it's a five-year cost, it's like, well, we might not be here in five years. So, um, and so one of the things really consider, you're not a large space, think are low cost, low tech solutions. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little later. Um, space is limited. One of the creative things I, I saw in some of these things was, it was a small vivarium, they're all on one floor. And if they had a building issue, it was in California, if they had building issues, they might have to lose the building or not use that. So they had set up part of their contingency plan with the local CRO that if there was an emergency, they can move all their animals there if space was available at the CRO. And they, they pre-set this up. Planning is everything. So they, they set this up. And so that was a wonderful thought. Um, and you know when you have contract and animal care staff, you really have to work into those things of what's gonna happen, who handles emergencies, can you have overtime and things like this and the training of the people. So um, the high level thought process is this, there's a couple areas I like to approach it and, and both are different, but both have value in to me. One is the um, FEMA kind of thing has four main principles. One's mitigation, prevention and minimization, of the effects. So that's where I look at, you know, redundancy of electrical systems and things like that. What can we do to make things less of a problem? But some of those things are small things too. In, I'm from the Northeast, we'd have big snowstorms. We would stock extra food in the winter if we have transportation issues and things like that. Preparedness, and that's sort of the next thing down below is be able to handle emergencies, training supplies, things like that. Training is really important. Um, and having things on hand, like um, things that, that hold water, if you need it to supply water to animals. Then responses is your action plan, what you're gonna do in, and the more decisions made ahead of time or philosophies that are communicated, 
um, you do that. You know, if you lose your heat in the winter, you're a big building and it's cold out, slow down your air system. So you have less air coming through and the building's actual retention of heat will actually keep things fairly warm for quite a while. That's a short-term solution, but it, it usually gets you through a lot. But someone has the authority to say, slow down the air handlers, you know? And as you know, librarians are very sensitive about their airflow and recovery what needs to get back to learning, get to normal and lessons learned. Now, in a, it's an old book. Um, there's a section in there in the arena book on institutional animal care and use committee guidebook. And there's a section on disaster preparedness. I think it's a lovely little section because I wrote it. Um, and some of that is um, a systems approach to look at things. So I look at things in two ways. It's sort of, okay, a hurricane. If a hurricane hits me, what are gonna be the primary effects? What are gonna be the secondary effects, the risk of occurrence and the impact? So you could have flooding, you could have electrical outages and stuff like that. So you kind of have to plan these out. It's for helpful people to do that. And then another systems approach is, okay, I have electrical outage. It doesn't matter kind of where it's from, but how are we gonna handle that? Um, okay. And so, so that's kind of a, a system of a way to look at things. It's, you know, the more things are logical to people in a stepwise manner, it, it, um, it really helps with them. Okay. Okay, overlapping responsibilities. John did a wonderful job addressing that. And, and you have the vivarium has its plane in the middle and the institution, all the engineers kind of have all sort of the the utilities type of plans and things like that. And one should know the others. So that you need to really cross fertilize each other's minds on these things and how they work. And the other thing is if the vivarium has all this, so my plan might be for a medium sized facility might be 40, 60 pages of plan, uh, our plan. And it could vary on how you do, but that references three volumes of the buildings, things that include maintenance logs, uh, maintenance, um, instructions and equipment lists and things like that, which I don't have to keep in my vivarium because the maintenance people have all that stuff. And he talked about the local uh, thing, you know, John always mentioned travel restrictions and stuff was, it became a big deal for us in snowstorms because the state of emergency, no one on the road, but, but first responders. So trying to get a, to be a first responder. I know I, I actually accident for buildings. I have access. I have a, a, a hospital ID in Dr. Reinhardt. So it, it may get me not arrested like John almost mm -hmm. got, but uh, I don't know. And hopefully I don't ever have to test that. Um, and contact information for regional emergency response. I think that needs to be done ahead of time. And in retrospect, I think that's something I didn't do as much as I should, but I do know the institution did. So we had tours of firemen, we had tours of police of the buildings. And some of the fire says, oh, this is all chemistry here. Yeah, we're standing outside, make sure no other buildings go down and we're going to be upwind, you know? <laughs> so, but we also had internal firemen and internal EMT people. So they were happy to get the tour of what it was. Um, responsibilities. Uh, everyone during a disaster has responsibilities and you might not be high on their list. The on the campus I was in, all the, all the maintenance people worked in manufacturing. So their boss was in charge of manufacturing. So, you know, sometimes you have, well, my boss wants me to take care of the line. Uh, you want me to help with mice. So sometimes you have to make sure you can get things done. Don't always assume the top person, I put the attending vet, but that could be facility manager, the person who knows the plan. You really have to, the, the trick in planning is making people smarter. So you need to spread that smartness, a bunch of whole bunch of people, all the senior supervisors, junior supervisors, the more they know, because it just might be the junior supervisor, the only one could walk through seven feet of snow to get in that day. So that person needs to know as much as possible. They can, pro they have the, the laptop with their plan in there, but if they feel they've been trained and empowered, the more they feel comfortable with the decisions at the time. And cross-training with non-animal people, I think the maintenance people and the engineers and stuff is really helpful. Um, Pre-plan, yeah, as I said, the pre-plan are proper uh, things. And there's all sorts of things that go on that I didn't learn until I hung out with sort of some engineers. You know, if there's a fire next to the vivarium, I'll give an example, and you're sucking in 
uh, smoke into the thing. Well, the, the response is to turn off your air handler. You want to do that. But again, we're very sensitive about air. Who has permission to say to do that? It turns out, actually, most air handlers by code have smoke detectors, and they will automatically trigger an alarm, and if not, shut off the airflow coming in. So those things are automatic. I learned this because one of them shorted and shut off my air supply, and I have no idea why my, my, my units weren't running. But you learn these things. And the other thing would be, you know, is pre-plan and talk with scientists if you have satellite facilities it might be best to relocate them within the facility if you have to. If, if you have lots of rats on reverse light cycle, you know, and the scientist is in charge of taking care of them, they might not be able to get in, but you know your people will be in trained. So you might have to move them into your vivarium, but pre-plan that. You can easily switch light cycles in a room and expect, and expect the unexpected. One person I know who is attending veterinarian went through several hurricanes down, I think in South Carolina and said, yeah, you take your emergency plan, as soon as the hurricane hits, you just shred it because everything else is it's going to be um, different than you planned. But I, I don't wanna leave out sort of civic emergencies or all sorts of things, security intrusions, personnel strikes, you ran, you know, people out there, demonstrations, computer network attack. I actually had that list from when I wrote the arena thing, but now that happened. I know one pharma that got hit with a ransomware virus and they lost $2 billion. It took them $2 billion to recover from that. They basically threw out every computer, every laptop, every computer. So, you know, you have a building automation system in there, which I never thought of. That gets attacked. Ooh, that could be an issue. So doing this helped me prepare more saying, oh, I got to look at this in our, our planning thing. What happens if we do lose that system? They might have a, a software backup they can plug in right away with a new laptop or something. Anyway, public relations, John talked about that line, supply issues, employee health related issues, COVID. No one planned on the COVID lasting as long as they did. We had some flu type of things in there. We actually had a in the University of Pennsylvania, we had a visit by the Pope into Philadelphia. And we they set up perimeters. You couldn't enter the city unless you had permission. So we were in that circle. So we had to get exemptions for people to go to work as essential workers. So that was our Pope crisis. So, and there's also research integrity things. It, it might be a small thing, but uh, a published paper that has questioned their animal research in there or something, you need a response team to address that. Like newspaper people, editors sometimes are want a response really quick. But anyway, putting these things for different for the different different things, I want to make the point you might need different teams or different groups to handle this. The communication people are, are key in, in, in some of these things, a lot more than some of the other emergencies. So um uh so uh, Yogi Bear quote is not correct here, but it's when it's over, uh, it ain't over till it's over because there's a lot of post-traumatic things that happen and you really have to think of your people. Your rock animal care tech that was there for you know 18 hours a day taking care of things was solid, right? He might have post-traumatic stress syndrome after that, trouble sleeping, anxiety, and things like that. So really make sure people know about our health and, and supervisors and coworkers need to know about the signs because a person probably won't realize they're having issues. And it's your friends that will most likely tell you. So it's important to do that. And also remember to celebrate the people that did help and, and successfully getting through the things. Um, and you know, I did mention you, the, the unexpected things, they do happen. I live in New Jersey, earthquakes were not a big part of our plan. I was at the epicenter of a 4.8 earthquake um, not long ago. We've had 300 um, follow-up things. We're there and you hear a bang when there's a fractured subsurface of the earth and then the rumbles go on for 20, it's very strange. So my first earthquake was just a few weeks ago. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the, they want us to comment on our, um, contingency rule impact. And for us, it wasn't too bad really, because unless you're new biotech, you, you didn't have one. We large pharmas did have it. It was a course of business. So it wasn't too bad for us. We, and ALAC creation required it. So standard business practice. The biggest part was the training requirement. And I think that kind of gave us, it was a bit too 
prescriptive and didn't allow some creativity in there when to train. You know, a new employee really does get dumped with a lot of information. And you have to learn the building and the job a little better to understand the emergency plan. So I would rather have this one of the latter things a person gets trained and things like that. So um, and, and on their, their form, they should, I know it's in the section where the, you know, event and who's responsible, but I think key maintenance people should be up on that first list where you have, you know, a toxic, you know, who do you call local for, just, I think your key maintenance people should up. It's just so I don't have to search for things. I did a quick off the cuff and I didn't write it down because it's so rough. We did a refresh when the regulations came in. So we revisited the plan. We had a committee, went through it. We retrained all our staff. So we had good training documentation because everyone loves good documentation. We had our training updated and things like that. So our onboard training covers this and things like that. It took us uh, probably a little over 500 uh, man hour or human hours to do this, which is probably one quarter full-time equivalent to do, to do this. Okay. So I got on a breeze through, I got four minutes left. I will breeze through some I call nuggets of knowledge. These are my fun things. This is where you could sit in a pub all night and talk about disasters and things. Hey, did you think about this? So one thing I learned someone who's in a disaster, cash is king. Elect you no know, electricity, no credit cards working, no so stores might be open or peep service people might be there, but you no way to put on a credit card and they want payment. Who I don't know, you're, you're buying 20 bags of ice. I want cash, you know. So cash is king. And in a corporation, I don't know, it's really hard to pile it, get a pile of cash. So I just went and took out when Sandy came, I took several thousand dollars out and put it in my pocket. Um, and I figured, well, the accountants will figure this out later for what I pay for cash, and hopefully I can get some sort of receipts and stuff. And you know, but anyway. So that, that's really important. Um, generator testing, you know, if you have five, 10 buildings on campus and you need to run them for three weeks, an engineer will tell you there's no problems. They're all set to go or anything. You shouldn't have problems. Murphy's Law says, I bet one of those goes out. So anyway, um, in terms of testing generators, one of the things they're testing is turn on the car, you turn them on. The other one is testing with load, which is really a headache. You're putting you know, the building using electricity on it or these load users or kind of giant toasters that use electricity. So testing with load is also important. It should be not done every time you test it, but maybe periodically. External access to get stuff in. So you lose steam from your central thing. You can easily have a connection to the outside and get a portable steam generator, which is a picture in the lower right there. And you just drive that up and plug it in. And all of a sudden, hey, I got steam for my building. You have to run out a lot of electricity for that sucker. But, um, you know, those sorts of things. So for boilers, electricity, sort of outside connection things and drinking water. We had a facility in France. Um, we asked them about their emergency drinking water and they had manufacturing there. So water was very important for the campus. And they said, oh, yes, we contracted with a local French water purveyor that makes very high-end water that you will buy for four dollars in a store and they go oh yes we can help you do you want sparkling or still <laughs> we'll say we'll take a truckload of still in case of an emergency <laughs> but they were drinking very nice water if they had to but having all this stuff and how to get it to where you need it is really important i love redundancy and so as a capital project so my big box on the left is like an air handler for one building one giant one really runs or it can do two smaller ones that have the same load capacity, but one goes out and you have the other. Or you can service one and you just say, my favorite is you have the three and then one's always in reserve. So you could always take down one and do that and you're always at 100%. Okay, so um, I have some more nuggets, come on. Okay, love thy neighbor. Um, connect, cross connect emergency generators. I said, you have 10 buildings on campus, chances are one might go out over a period. So it's really good you can figure out how to cross connect. You might have to shed load and spec power less. So instead of full lighting, you might just use emergency lighting or something. So, but that's important. Um, and two utilities are better than others. Uh, um, different sources, I already mentioned that. But if you can loop things, so it's a giant circle. So let me put my loop in here. So if you have an interruption, so the blue place goes out and that's where the problem with John is all the water shooting out the front door. You can tie off that building and then you could feed it all the way from the rest of the loop. 
So those things are really nice. Bi-directional things, like, like engineers will know that, switch gear and stuff. I don't, I just know they're expensive. And don't forget old school stuff, especially for the biotechs. Uh, portable fans, portable humidifiers, uh, heaters and things like that. Water cowboys you can put on top of the thing. Um, part of our plan was we had a big office comp section there. We were gonna confiscate all the water bottles, the five gallon water bottles for the water tank in case we needed it. Part three, am I doing? Okay, I, I'll be really quick. Uh, stock spare, part, spare parts for key motor things. Uh, key things that are for your thing. So it's uh, motor belts and sensors and key valves and things like that. I paid maintenance to, to store some of this stuff. So we always had it on hand as opposed to you have an emergency and it takes 48 hours to get it and stuff. Um, be prepared to be portable. Elevators might not be working. So your relocation plans have to include the probability that your elevator might be not be working. So relocating mouse cages, you just tape down the mouse tops. Do you have enough tape? Euthanasia, need portable supplies and things like that. Uh, caging, flashlights. And local housing for employees. We were big enough. We, we actually put up some people when oncoming big storms in a local hotel. They can walk to work. And volunteers for that. And they enjoyed, hey, I got a night at the hotel. It's fine. My meals were paid for. It was good. You know, then it was a snowstorm. They really worked hard. And the other thing, phone charging is a big thing now. Make sure you have that and stuff. And just as a tip, texting is the is the le last thing to go down in communication networks. So voice goes down, internet goes down, but texting is kind of a low, lower tech kind of thing that really works. So that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, and again, we're having the questions during the panel discussion later. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Warren Hess from the AVMA, and he's going to talk from the perspective of the AVMA, and he's the disaster coordinator for the organization. Uh, over to you, Warren. Um, we can't hear you, sorry. Now you can hear me, hopefully. Yes. Perfect. Okay, um, so I uh, work for the uh, American Veterinary Medical Association. I've just reached 20 years uh, with uh, disaster related experience in my in my uh, career. And so I'm gonna share a few things from uh, just a couple of lessons learned, which you've already heard from John and Greg, but I'm going to just repeat a couple of them, and then I'm going to go into some of the uh, some of the other uh, resources that are available um, for you. Um, could you advance? It looks like I'm not don't have control. So same uh, same lessons are repeated over and over and over again with, with disasters. Uh, if you could advance again. So business continuity planning, we've already talked about that. Um, and I would agree with what's been said about the fact that the, the plan, uh, the written plan, while it is probably needed, uh, for your purposes, usually doesn't get looked at, at least not during the first few days of a major event. Um, so you're reacting based on exercises that you've had um, and the learning and the discussions that you've had in developing the plan. As John mentioned, how important relationships are, um, that's critical. Um, We'll talk about some of the relationships a little bit uh, later in my slide, um, in my slide deck. So we'll talk about you know who those are and um, and then uh, communications. I can't emphasize enough that not just how you communicate is a major issue during disasters 
but what is being communicated and how people are perceiving what's being communicated. Because when uh, things are stressful, uh, normal communication habits kind of go out the door and people misunderstand one another. They're not complete rushing their communication or the communication might be cryptic based on what's available. Uh, so really critical to make sure, you know, not just that you can communicate, but that people are being understood properly. And then John also uh, mentioned prescripted public messaging. Uh, so important to try to come up with some of that messaging ahead of time so that you can um, um, at least have a template to go on and make minor revisions to it. Uh, some really embarrassing situations have happened when people develop messaging on the fly again because you know there's a lot of stress going on and people aren't thinking real clearly and sometimes messaging uh, especially if it's going out to the public can be uh, uh, can be embarrassing if you uh, if, if you don't have something developed during the calm times that you can look at so if you want to advance again Um, so let's talk about some resources at, at, um, right now. Um, we're going to look at some of these uh, acronyms here um, over the next few slides and, and talk about some of the um, some of these resources and how they might be helpful to you if you could advance. So the National Alliance of State Animal Agricultural Emergency Programs, or what's termed NASEP, uh, is a, a is a national association that helps to uh, network um, local, state, and federal uh, resources and uh, responders. Um, next. There are voting members um, of this organization. Um, there's one official voting member from each state, usually identified by the Department of Agriculture or the Emer State Emergency Management Organization. But anybody can be a member of this organization and uh, individual memberships are, I think, still at $25. So it's very, very affordable. Next. They hold a summit about roughly every 18 months or so that is the premier uh, disaster summit for animal and agricultural events in the country. And uh, it's held in, in various places around the US. The next one uh, will be coming up in this December. And you could go to the website there, you can see over um, under the logo to get more information on that. One of the major things that uh, NACEP has done is they developed some best practice white papers on these various topics that you see here. Um, and uh, some of these might be topics that you may want to be aware of, and those are also available at the, at the website. So you could look those up and and find information that's been put together by um, some um, experts from around the country. Next. The National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition, or NARSC, um, is an organization of response, a national response organization organizations that work with animals and organizations that fund efforts in, in that area. Uh, next. Um, 
NARSC was developed uh, shortly after uh, Hurricane Katrina with so many of, uh, there were a lot of problems with animal response during Hurricane Katrina, especially with ethical considerations with some of the groups. And that was the main reason that this organization was developed um, to, to work together to make sure that uh, everyone's held accountable for how they are responding and next. And then here are some of, uh, or here are the member organizations uh, that belong to NARSC. There, NARSC uh, develops uh, MOUs with various um, states and counties around the country. And so you might want to be aware whether your state or county has an MOU with NARSC directly or with one of the NARSC members, um, especially those that are the response groups. Okay, next. From the uh, resources from the AVMA, um, AVMA a few years ago developed their um, digital education platform, which is called Axon. Two courses there that might be of interest to you would be first the Disaster Business Continuity Certificate Program, which takes you through basically how to uh, how to develop a, a business continuity plan. Um, it might be really helpful. For those of you that are uh, new to this process, um, it is uh, these um, modules are free for AVMA members. So if your uh, if your veterinarian is an AVMA member, they should be able to get access to this uh, at no cost. It, uh, anybody can get uh, can use it uh, for a cost, but ABMA members is free. And then the second uh, one that I'll mention is the Veterinary First Responder Certificate Program um, that was launched a couple of years ago. This is specifically for uh, veterinary first responders, and it takes them through some of the minimal uh, core competencies that they should be aware of. Some of the information in that um, program might also uh, be a benefit for you. Next slide. You're probably many of you are very familiar with the ABMA uh, guidelines for the euthanasia of animals. That's one of the ABMA humane ending guidelines that um, ABMA maintains. But you may not be aware of the next one, if you could click that, the AVMA guidelines for the depopulation of animals. So when crisis hits and if animals need to be euthanized uh, in a time frame or in manners that don't fit the guidelines for euthanasia, then there are guidelines for depopulating animals which is a different set of goals that you're trying to reach versus euthanasia. Um, there may be times when some of your research facilities might be faced with this. Uh, guidelines for the depopulation of animals needs to be looked at ahead of time and decisions pre-planned ahead of time as far as what kind of alternate methods you would consider using if the euthanasia methods are not available or practical. So both of those are available at the uh, at the ABMA website. Next. And then we also have resources for carcass disposal. Um, most research institutions are dealing with, you know, smaller animals, but if you have larger animals and there's a large number of them, uh, carcass disposal can become an issue. And uh, these resources help you to um, understand what some of those options might be and um, some of the things you want to try to uh, avoid as far as drug residues and that sort of thing. Next. 
our foundation uh, has a couple of disaster grants that may be of interest to you. There are two different ones that uh, are available. So there is a reimbursement grant that's up to $5,000 that may be issued uh, to each grantee for out-of-pocket expenses incurred by veterinarians providing care to animals that are victims in the disasters. Um, and then there is a $2,000 relief grant that's available to veterinarians who um, or their technicians who are directly impacted by a disaster. So whether your work is impacted or your, your home uh, is impacted, that's where the disaster relief grant can come into play. And there's the um, a URL for it that you can get at the uh, foundation website. Next slide. The National Veterinary Response Team. Um, this is the only federal resource for uh, uh, veterinary response teams that exist in the country. Uh, they operate under the National Disaster Medical System or NDMS, which operates under ASPR or the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response. They've uh, got a variety of individuals with expertise, including veterinarian techs, epidemi epidemiologists, uh, safety specialists, et cetera. And then um, they can provide assessments, technical assistance, public health and veterinary services. And they um, have to be activated through the state. So local authorities would make a request to the state and the state would request the services of that national veterinary response team. Next slide. One thing uh, that might be of assistance for those of you who are creating plans, if you're not already aware of this resource is the National Fire Protection Association which is a national organization that was developed uh, many years ago to uh, help develop information um, and to minimize misinformation. They've come up with more than 300 codes and standards. Um, and one of the ones they've come up with is um, this uh, 1660 document. It is actually a compilation of three previous documents, which, which was 1600, 1616, and 1620. 1600 was the continuity uh, standards for continuity uh, and preparedness and response. And that section of this new 1660 2024 publication uh, is something that might be very helpful to you. Um, I got the impression that uh, maybe John had read that um, or was aware of it uh, based on the presentation that he gave because uh, a number of his principles are uh, outlined in, in that document. And if not, then, then great minds think alike and um, um, that might be helpful for you as you put your plan together. Next. All right, let's just talk about briefly some state level resources. Um, and these are again, um, um, relationships that you should be building. Somebody in your organization should have a relationship with the chief animal health official, the state veterinarian. I spent 11 years uh, in the state, veterinary, state veterinarian's office in Utah. Uh, in various roles from field veterinarian all the way up to acting state veterinarian. Um, they are a critical resource to know. If, if uh, you don't know who they are or you don't have a current relationship with them, uh, that would be number one on a state level. Number two would be the state emergency manager. Somebody in your organization should know the state emergency manager, have their phone number, um, have 
been to meetings with them, been out to lunch with them, something um, so that that uh, communication is happening. That can really help if uh, you need to get into your building, John, to uh, access your animals. If you can call up the state emergency manager and say, hey, I'm having trouble here, and they can call the um, the police or uh, state police or whoever it is, city, county police, um, or sheriff's office, let them know that uh, you're good to go. That uh, that can go a long way. Um, many state veterinary medical associations have um, uh, programs or uh, res veterinary response teams that uh, you might want to be aware of. If you have uh, close to you um, a veterinary school or college, some of those have veterinary response teams that uh, you might want to be aware of. And then there could be other state recognized animal response organizations that may not be specifically veterinary response teams, but they might uh, be helpful in certain situations. If they are state recognized or a state asset, that means that they are written into the state's uh, emergency response plans. And you know that organization is trusted and working. There might be other local animal response organizations that are in your area that aren't uh, a state asset, but they still may be um, uh, a resource for you, especially if you uh, have a relationship with them. And then I'll just end up here on the local level. Um, if you could go to the next click on the on the local level, um, your county or city emergency manager is another individual that you should have a relationship with somebody in your organization should. And then the next one would be any local veterinary practices in your area that might be able to provide assistance, help, supplies, space, you know, any any number of things that they might be able to do. Again, if you have an existing relationship with them, that's going to be uh, very helpful. And I think that finishes out what I've got. Thank you. And we'll uh, deal with questions later. And thank you, Warren. And that takes us just a little past time. So we're taking a break to 2.30 Eastern time, and we'll be back for the next three panelists.